Remember from 2012 to 2018, when Marvel films were coming out every year, and it was exciting every year? Maybe the films weren't great, hell, most of them are bad. They still told a captivating story, at least character-wise. You could keep invested in a lot of these characters, and it was still exciting, and you never felt like, you know, the films were trying to destroy this world you're invested in. Yeah, let's talk about how Shang-Chi does that as well. So the film starts with an oration by Ying Li, saying that the Legend of the Ten Rings has been passed down for millennia, and that Wenwu, the Mandarin, has been always at the center of it. And then we see Wenwu fighting the Romans, which means that, you know, Wenwu has been around for at least 2,000 years, and that's already, um, not the best thing to establish. If you have someone that has been alive for 2,000 years in this universe, in this world, don't you think the world building would have been a lot different? Like, religion wouldn't be the same. Like, they have someone that can confirm whether or not what happened with Jesus is true or not. And considering how old he is, there'd be religions worshipping Wenwu himself. And that would affect literally every MCU film, like even Guardians of the Galaxy, because Peter Quill wouldn't be the same as he is. Hell, Ego coming to Earth wouldn't have been the same. And then we see Wenwu fighting the Romans, and the Romans for some reason all shoot arrows at Wenwu himself, rather than trying to shoot any arrows at all at his fucking army? You fuckhead. You know the Romans are strategic geniuses. So that scene establishes that the Ten Rings pretty much make you immortal and invulnerable to any sort of damage whatsoever, considering how Wenwu just fights through the Romans super easily. So considering that and the fact that he's been around for 2000 years, and the fact that he wants to conquer Earth and control everything because all he wants is power, he should control the entire world. If they studied the powers of the Ten Rings and their technology, he'd potentially be able to create weapons with it, like Zola and Red Skull did with the Tesseract in World War II. And so Wenwu would just be able to conquer the world, he'd be Emperor of Earth. It's not like he didn't want it. The narration in the beginning says he could have used the Ten Rings for good, but all he wanted was power. Seems like that'd be beneficial for him if he actually wanted to conquer Earth. To, you know, conquer Earth. And then when Wu attacks the Roman soldiers and he throws his rings at the castle and not a single Roman soldier tries to attack him when the rings aren't with him anymore, even though he's now pretty exposed and he doesn't have the best weapon in his arsenal. Not to mention the choreography just in general in that scene is bad, but hard to say that before the Blu-ray release, to be honest. Oh, and the Roman soldiers just don't use their arrows to try to kill Wenwu's army, even though Wenwu's army is attacking them, like, right after. Okay, so now the film says that Wenwu started his own army called the Ten Rings and used it to control the world from the shadows. So firstly, why did he not take the whole world for himself and control it as his empire? I know I've already said this, but this breaks the entire MCU. Like, this is probably the worst piece of world building in the MCU ever. Secondly, why would he allow Hydra to exist? Not only Hydra, but Dracov and the Red Room. Either he didn't know they existed, which is dumb, or he did and allowed them to exist despite their goals not aligning with the zone, since they also controlled politics and events through time to achieve their goals. As evidenced by the line, he worked in the shadows, toppled governments, and changed the course of history. So there are just these three factions, the Red Room, Hydra, and Wenwu, with the Ten Rings. And I guess they just coexist in the MCU, even though Wenwu's Ten Rings have been around for 2000 years? So then Ying Li says, having nothing more to conquer on Earth, he attacked her home. But, um... Clearly, he still had stuff to conquer on Earth. It was 1996, and, like, pretty much nobody knows about Wenwu. He doesn't really control, well, anything. This just doesn't make any sense. Like, if Wenwu has been around for that long, you'd think, firstly, that he would have encountered the sorcerers, considering the Ancient One was born in 1317, and she's been around since then until 2016 when she died. She just never encountered him, even though his rings are weapons from another dimension, which is literally what the Ancient One wants to protect the world from, other dimensional threats to Earth. And Wenwu also just never tried to get the Tesseract, even though the legend of the Tesseract is known enough for Red Skull to find it in World War II, but I guess Wenwu just never looked for it. Hell, the Eye of Agamotto is another Infinity Stone that is also on Earth, and he never tried to find it. Reality Stone was also on Earth, by the way, considering Thor the Dark World. So there are three Infinity Stones on Earth that I guess Wenwu just never bothered to go grab, even though his whole thing is power. So having the Infinity Stones, you know, the stones that control all of space, time, reality, he just didn't bother to try to get them? 
Okay, film, whatever you say. And it's also especially dumb when Ying Li says he conquered everything he could on Earth, which means probably the next thing you do is either go to a different dimension, like he does, trying to get to Talo, or space travel, which space travel he would have been able to achieve a long time ago if he had the Tesseract. And if you know, he actually tried to study the Ten Rings to advance technology for himself. Hell, why did Wenwu never go to Wakanda and grab Vibranium? Like, Wenwu's army should be the most advanced army in, like, a bunch of solar systems. Like, he should be so extremely powerful and he just isn't, I guess. Okay, Phil. So then Wenwu tries to get to Talo, which is this other dimensional village that has a dragon called the Great Protector that gives people who live their powers. And so Wenwu's car is thrown off a cliff by a bamboo forest because the bamboo forest is the guardian of the passageway to Talo, which keep that in mind, I'm not done with it yet. So then Wenwu sees Ying Li at the entrance of Talo and she tells him to leave because he's not welcome and that if he leaves, he'll be spared. And then after they fight and Ying Li beats him, he's spared? She just doesn't kill him or try killing him when he's beaten and defenseless, despite him fighting her. She actually tries to save him when he falls after hitting the tree, throwing him in the water, and using her wind power to make him not get hurt as much, or die from the fall. Not to mention how stupid the fight is, because Wenwu does not use the rings as well as he could when he tries fighting Ying Li. I mean, he keeps closing the fucking distance. Not to mention how Wenwu just stops to watch Ying Li fucking doing her poses before they fight, as opposed to attacking her. When all he wants to do is conquer Talo, so it's just really dumb. And somehow Ying Li can defend the blows that happen with the rings, even though that's not supposed to be the case. The rings are supposed to be really strong and Ying Li is not established to be super durable, since the people from her village don't have super durability either in the third act, so even if she has powers here, because it's still in or close to Talo, she shouldn't be able to do that. And then one of Ying Li's attacks to fighting Wenwu is to just dance with him? Um... Okay, and Wenwu just doesn't use his left arm, even though, you know, that arm has um five of the ten rings on it, but he, I, he just does not use it. And then Ying Li somehow can control the rings and just do this weird Kamehameha thing where it becomes a ball of energy that she uses to attack Wenwu, even though she never saw the rings before this moment. So, okay, she just has these random powers now, that's great. Then after Ying Li beats Wenwu, she just teleports away somehow. And then we see that Ying Li was telling that story to Shang-Chi, and she gives him a pendant that says that'll guide him home. And then we cut to present day, the MCU, 2024, where we meet Shang-Chi and his friend Katie and their valet drivers. And apparently Katie just takes one of the cars she's supposed to be parking and um, takes a fucking wild drive in it. Um, Shang-Chi and Katie should be fired, but okay, I whatever. Then later we have a scene where Shang-Chi and Katie meet some of their friends, and their friend says that Shang-Chi and Katie should start living up to their potential, that they need to grow up and stop being so childish. And then Katie says she sounds like her mom. And then the next scene after Shang-Chi and Katie go to a fucking karaoke, which is the most useless scene ever. We see Shang-Chi picking up Katie at her house, and then we have Shang-Chi talking to Katie's grandma, Katie's mom, Katie's brother. And all that's established in that scene is that Katie's mom wants Katie to live up to her potential, which was already established by the last scene. So we have an entire scene, which is almost two minutes, uh, that scene, where nothing of worth happens. So you could have just had Shang-Chi arriving at the at Katie's place and then picking her up at the door and then they uh, get you the bus. And then that's it. There's like, you're not wasting time. And I think there's a lot of that in the film where it's just, it's trying, it's doing stuff that isn't necessary because it's already been established. And uh, honestly, I think it's the kind of thing that would have been cut had the director had less control over the film, which I honestly think they should have, I honestly think, like, a bit of studio meddling could have been better in, at this point. Uh, like, it feels the kind of thing where the the director wanted to establish this thing about this family because, you know, oh, culture and uh, Chinese culture, instead of actually just focusing on what's relevant to the plot. I don't know if I've said this yet, but the pacing of this film is really fucking bad. And then Shang-Chi and Katie catch a bus to go to work. And then Shang-Chi gets attacked in the bus because some goons show up and they want to grab his pendant, which is the pendant his mom had given him when he was a kid. And then to everyone's surprise, Shang-Chi starts fighting them with like martial arts, which Katie didn't know about despite being Shang-Chi's friend for 10 years. Shang-Chi would have to like train with someone 
you know, to to still be at peak performance. Like he'd have yeah. to go to like a, a fighting gym or something, but there's no like scene like hinting that or anything showing showing that he's like exercising or you know training oh yeah with oh, a person. like you said oh it cause... shows him doing push-ups after he wakes up uh, yeah that's, which is that's definitely like not, not the enough. same yeah it's just being in shape um so and and also like the whole reason why he left um he never returned to the compound after he killed the person who killed his mom it's like because he wanted to like completely dis disassociate himself from the life he was previously living so i also don't believe that he'd willingly want to go train to continue to be a fighter or like an assassin that is true yeah i hadn't, you know? I hadn't actually thought of that I, I don't think he would actually want to train and i think he just he just want to live like a normal life so i don't believe he's been training I mean, for yeah, 10 years the point of uh, of him leaving and the life he has been living is simply just like actually live a normal life so yeah <laughs> him continue and, to train would be really uh contradicting to that it, it and 10 to. years is a long time like i someone who has stopped like training in a in a martial arts i'm sure would forget a lot about it oh well, yeah i used to stopped. i used to train uh judo when i was little it's been years since yeah. i can like do nothing <laughs> Uh, that I, I mean, I did when I was a kid. I did Taekwondo for like three or four years in high school, and that was like five or six years ago. So it's like uh, I I've forgotten everything by mm -hmm. this point. <laughs> so yeah. so I I can't imagine what ten years does to a person. Um, ten years that actively trying to repress what what you learn. Yeah. <laughs> and not gonna lie, the first half of that bus fight scene works pretty well, pretty well choreographed despite the beginning of the fight scene being kind of weird. First half, before the Blade Arm Man shows up, is fine. But then the Blade Arm Man shows up, and he's a walking tentacle blade. If they do want to kill Shang-Chi, why was Blade Arm Man waiting until all of the other goons were dealt with? If they don't, why is he here? Which, obviously, the latter only becomes an issue when it's revealed when Wu didn't want Sha Ling or Shang-Chi to die, which hasn't happened yet. So just keep that in mind, I'm not done with it yet. So then we have a very poorly choreographed fight scene with Shang-Chi and Blade Arm Man, which would have been over a billion times if Blade Arm Man wasn't retarded because his blade is attached to his forearm, which means he could have just moved his elbow and killed Shang-Chi a bunch of times. But he moves it as though only his shoulders can be moved to change where the blade is instead of just moving his elbow, so he's really fucking dumb. But it's not like he's an elite assassin sent by one of the world's greatest threats and greatest powers, or at least what the film's trying to imply it is, but, you know. When was kind of retarded. And then Blade Arm Man cuts the brakes off the bus, and the bus is just speeding through the city, and the police are just nowhere to be found for this entire scene. And then the bus driver, he hits his head because of contrived bullshit, and when he does, Katie needs to take over and drive the bus, which she does. The bus driver just happens to hit his head on the steering wheel and pass out because he happened to look away exactly when a car was uh, crossing the road in front of them. It's like, okay, thank you. Oh, I want to point out as well, I don't know why films keep doing it, buses aren't easy to drive, you need a specific license. Yeah, and to buses learn how to and drive trucks and whatever, they're like a lot harder to drive. I mean, but that's uh, uh, a cadet for a bus service that drives buses. It's like, it's a lot harder than you're making it seem, film, it's not just steering a wheel. And then Shang-Chi keeps fighting Blade Arm Man until Blade Arm Man cuts the place where the two parts of the bus are connected to one another. And that's how Shang-Chi wins the fight, though Shang-Chi just loses his pendant at the end. Which is really funny because Shang-Chi just does not bother to run after Blade Arm Man even though he knows he has the pendant at that point after the bus stops. Not to mention how the police show up only after the bus has already stopped, not before. Not to mention how Shang-Chi just manages to get away from the police with Katie, as does Blade Arm Man, and they never get stopped for questioning. Even though there was a guy streaming Shang-Chi fighting in the bus and that video got like 2 million views so the police would definitely know who Shang-Chi is and they would go to him to interrogate him which means they wouldn't have let him board a plane like two scenes later so that already kind of just also breaks everything which is pretty neat and all because they wanted some funny haha -ha Marvel humor during the fight scene which completely kills the tone oh, I was gonna say before we judge that I do want to point out the obnoxious fucking joke about Oh, look, I'm a martial arts person. I'm gonna rape this. 
and it oh, just yeah. kept killing said, the tone. Yeah, he said it was gonna break down the fight or whatever the fuck because uh, he was a he took martial arts when he was a uh, like when he, he was younger or whatever. It's like there's this guy in the bus who just starts streaming the fight on like Instagram Live. Uh, uh, and it's just, yeah, he kills the tone completely because out of nowhere in the fights, you just hear him interject with some stupid shit. And it's really yeah, why? Fun. It's the Marvel mandated jokes, right? It just very yes. clearly just Marvel is like, okay, so and then this they, is just serious, we need a joke. And then they double down on that because they like cut back to him like a couple of minutes later. Oh, and yeah. It's like, why? Yeah, there was the moment where he's like, oh, I'm not driving the bus. Every time I try to drive the bus, people get angry at me. I'm like, who? I didn't. I forgot you existed. Why? Or why are you speaking? And they try and do the MCU fan service bait by having it be the same guy in Homecoming. This is still a backflip. Yeah, I did not. Oh, that was him. He was in Homecoming. Yeah. yeah. Oh shit. <laughs> I'll get. I'll get an image of him up in Homecoming. Yeah. Until you Homecoming. said it was, I had no idea he was in Homecoming. Which I guess. I mean, if they want to do fan service, I don't think getting a random guy from Homecoming is the best idea, but, you know, Marvel will be doing more. Yeah, also, they were in San Francisco, and Homecoming was in New York. Hey, he can move. Between he's a long distance. He, he's just, he just happened to, to be in San Francisco when this is taking place. Yeah, he just happened to meet another superhero. It's fine. And it's not like it's pro plot yeah. relevant that he's streaming, right? Like, oh, it's definitely not how... Fucking Shaolin finds out about Shang Chi. Mm. Hmm. So then Shang Chi goes home with Katie and starts packing because he says he's going to Macau because he was sent a postcard two months ago that he assumes is from his sister telling him to go to Macau to meet her. Which begs the question of why the fuck did he not go before if he did actually think it's his sister? And if he didn't, why is he going now? He was just attacked by his dad and his goons. Why in the fuck would he decide to just go somewhere that a postcard says? I mean, how would his sister even know where he is? Supposedly, he's been hiding. The second he got that postcard, he should should have been extremely careful. He should have, in theory, moved because the postcard means that either his sister knows his location or his father knows his location, which means he hasn't been hiding as well as he could have. And the entire point of him not coming back after he kills his mom's killer was to leave the life he had with his father behind. And he never bothered to help his sister, so why does he care now? And either way, even if it was his sister, why would he not move? Like, now she knows his location, which means that by proxy, his father may as well also know the location because... As far as Shang-Chi knows, his sister is still with their dad because he abandoned her and never came back. And Shang-Chi's reasoning for going after his sister is explained by him saying, those guys were sent by my dad. They'll go after my sister. If they hurt her, I'm sorry, I have to go. Which implies he wants to protect his sister even though he abandoned her when he was 15 and just never bothered to come back. Which also begs the question of, Shang-Chi, if you knew where the compound was, where your father lives with the Ten Rings, and you actually wanted to put a stop to it, and you actually care enough about your sister to want to put a stop to Wenwu and the Ten Rings, why did you not just tell the authorities about this? Fucking reach out to S.H.I.E.L.D., to the police, to the FBI, to the CIA, and then get taken in for witness protection. Because if you actually want to hide from your father, witness protection is the best way to do it, so that accomplishes both goals you want. But I guess Shang-Chi just let his dad continue his rule of terror, which obviously is a terrible thing to do and very out of character. And a lot of people say that Chang chi is quite the heroic character, but he's not. I think he's actually a terrible person, even if he is the most heroic character in Phase 4 so far, other than John Walker. And then Chang chi says he's going to Macau and Katie says, okay, I'm going with you. And Chang chi for some reason allows her to, even though obviously this is going to be dangerous because he's going to protect his sister from his father's goons, which means there probably is going to be fighting. So why would he take his best friend as opposed to just not taking her? Just say no. And even if she pushes it, just leave her behind. She's not going to be able to find you because you're a trained assassin who has been hiding since you were 15. In theory, it should be easy to leave Katie behind. But I guess he just wants to take her because we need our comic relief character. Even though it makes absolutely no sense to bring her. Which also doesn't help Shang-Chi's character because he's endangering his friend for absolutely no reason. But then we have an exposition scene where Shang-Chi explains his backstory to Katie. We learn that Wen Wu, after Ying Li died, started using the Ten Rings again and went back to his ways of terror. And then we learned that Shang-Chi was being trained since he was 7 years old, up until he was 15, to kill a man in every possible way, which was in preparation for killing his mother's killer, which we'll learn later in the film. And then we also learned that Cha Ling, Shang-Chi's sister, 
She taught herself how to use the rope daggers, which makes absolutely no sense. She only watched as the man trained, and she repeated it. And she got better than any assassin that was trained in Wenwu's army, even Shang-Chi. As we'll learn later in the film that Sha Ling says that she trained herself to be better than anyone else. Which makes absolutely no sense because she trained by herself with extremely dangerous daggers. Without proper counseling or supervision. Which means she would have hurt herself. And even then she would need to hide it from Wenwu because Wenwu didn't allow women, especially Sha Ling. Because Sha Ling reminded Wenwu of Ying Li to train. So it's absolutely impossible for Sha Ling to have trained herself. To not only know how to use the rope daggers but... To also be such a good fighter as we'll later see in the film when she fights Shang-Chi. So it's super fucking dumb. It makes absolutely no sense. Not to mention how she started at the age of 8 at the earliest. So she wouldn't even have the proper strength to use the rope daggers properly. And she only had 4 years to teach herself. While Shang-Chi had a longer time to learn how to kill people. And she somehow becomes better than him. Okay. So then as Shang-Chi is explaining his past, a flight attendant interrupts him for some terrible Marvel humor. The usual kind of Marvel tonally inconsistent humor. Because Shang-Chi was about to tell Katie about how he was trained to kill his mother's killer. But the flight attendant interrupts him to talk about what food they want. Okay, thanks film for ruining this moment tonally and pacing wise. Because we spent 30 seconds on this fucking joke that never ends. Instead of finally trying to get Shang-Chi some character. Which by the way, he still has none. All we know is his backstory, but backstory doesn't mean character. Don't worry, I'm, I'm sure we'll get there. And then Shang-Chi says he abandoned his dad and went to America and changed his name to Sean. And Katie makes fun of that, because changing your name from Shang-Chi to Sean, not gonna lie, not the best way to disguise your name. And yeah, the film making fun of it isn't really an excuse, it's just lampshading. Like, obviously it's an issue that Shang-Chi was that retarded. And then they arrive in Macau and they're going up this building where the postcard told them to go. And this person in the elevator tells them to sign a contract, which is supposed to be a sign-up sheet. And Shang-Chi just signs it without reading it, which is what allows him to fight Cha Ling later in the scene. For absolutely no reason. Fuck's sake. And then they get up to the level of the club and it's called the Golden Daggers Club. Which is an underground fighting ring with extremely powerful, skilled and even super powered people who fight for money and betting. And it's apparently streamed to the dark web. Sure, why not? And then we see that Wong is in here fighting Abomination. Wong and Abomination fighting is the main event. Wong being here makes no sense considering his character in Doctor Strange. It's super out of character for him to just be broadcasting his powers that way. Not to mention, he's supposed to be a very stoic and calm character that doesn't really break all that easily. But he keeps cracking jokes when he's fighting Abomination. And for some reason, which we'll later see when Wong teleports Abomination back to his cell, supposedly to the raft. The raft doesn't have good enough security to know when Abomination leaves or at least just stop it. Not to mention, why is Wong training Abomination? Like, the entire point of them fighting is for Wong to teach Abomination how to fight properly. Not just use his strength, but also technique. But why would he do that? Abomination is a villain. Like, Wong is supposedly Banner's friend. I mean, Banner shows up in the post credit scene to talk to Wong. So why the fuck are you trying to train Abomination? Like, it's super retarded and it's only here to be like yo i know that character and then the guy who introduced them to the golden daggers club says that shang chi is gonna fight because he signed the contract already which shang chi just accepts it and doesn't ask who he's gonna fight which is super funny because he just saw a sorcerer and a giant green monster fighting and he doesn't want to ask who he'll fight so he doesn't know what he's walking into like he's a skilled fighter but supposedly he hasn't fought in 10 years other than the bus fight which also makes the line where katie says you got this to him really dumb because she has no idea who shang chi will fight so really he hasn't got this which is made even worse by the fact that katie bets against shang chi so she definitely doesn't know that shang chi is gonna be okay and then we learn that shang chi is gonna fight Cha Ling, his sister and shang chi rather than actually trying to explain to his sister the situation about their father he just doesn't explain it properly all he does is say like we don't have time stop fighting let me explain instead of just right off the bat saying that is trying to kill us i came to help you before he does because i guess we need that fight scene between Cha Ling and shang chi which of course Cha Ling beats him because yes even though it makes absolutely no sense, like I stated earlier. And the choreography and durability in the scene is super inconsistent, but I can't break it down yet without the Blu-ray release. And then we see a flashback with Cha Ling and Shang-Chi, which Shang-Chi's last words to his sister were, I'll be back in three days, after she says, don't leave me here. 
So good on you for lying to your sister and abandoning her as a child. She definitely needed that with your abusive and emotionally distant father who couldn't even look at her because she reminded him too much of being Lee. You know, maybe, maybe you should have come back to save your sister, at the least. Not to mention how you should just turn your dad into the authorities, such as S.H.I.E.L.D., but whatever. And then after Shang-Chi and Cha Ling fight, and Shang-Chi loses, they talk, and Shang-Chi explains that their dad is after the pendants, which means he's going after Sha Ling. And then he learns that his sister didn't send him the postcard, which is obvious because why the fuck would you assume it was her? But whatever. And then when Wu's men invade the club and start killing a bunch of people to try to get after Shang-Chi and Xia Ling and Katie. Which makes me wonder how they do that because like I said earlier, they are super powered and extremely skilled fighters in this club. But they just do not fight back, which is whatever, it's really dumb. Also really convenient that Wen Wu only attacked after Abomination and Wong had left. And then for some reason Xia Ling abandons Shang-Chi and Katie, even though... She's the only one who has the pendant that Wenwu wants. So by abandoning them, she's just abandoning Shang-Chi, who's the best person to help protect her from getting her pendant stolen. But that doesn't really matter anyway, because for some reason they keep trying to kill Katie and Shang-Chi, and they do not go after Sha Ling until she returns to help Shang-Chi. Even though they already have Shang-Chi's pendant. So they're just wasting time and people because... Shang-Chi ends up killing a bunch of those goons. So that was incredibly dumb. Not to mention how Sha Ling coming back to help Shang-Chi is explained by her saying that she abandoned him because now you know what it feels like to be abandoned. Which, if you're going to abandon him, don't come back like two minutes later. And it's definitely not the same. It's complete false equivalence. Not to mention how you abandoning them would have been detrimental to you if Wen Wu's men were actually consistently written. And then there's a moment where Katie is hanging from a bamboo that was cut. Because they were like on scaffolding on the side of a building made out of bamboo. And the bamboo just does not break. It only breaks after Shang-Chi arrives there to save Katie. Which, wow, super lucky, isn't it? It's also really stupid that Wen Wu's men do not have guns. Or even knives, all they have is like these taser batons. Not to mention that if they actually did have guns or knives, Shang-Chi would have been dead. Because the moment Shang-Chi grabs Katie when she's falling from the bamboo, he's attacked by one of the tasers and he drops Katie. If it was actually a knife, he would have been dead. And Cha Ling manages to show up the exact moment she needs to to save Katie, because otherwise Katie would have died. And then there's this weird moment where Shang-Chi's interrogating this dude before dropping him, asking why their father sent them. And Xia Ling just makes Shang-Chi drop the guy and asks if America made him soft, even though he's killed a bunch of these goons already. So obviously he wasn't made soft. All he wanted was more information, which obviously is vital if you want to keep surviving. It's a pretty normal interrogation technique. Either you tell me or you die, which is why he was dangling him off the scaffolding. But I guess Xia Ling needed that badass moment for her for some reason. I don't know why, but sure, why not? And then this masked soldier called the Death Dealer shows up, which is dumb. Like, why would he not show up earlier if you actually don't care about killing Sha Ling and Shang-Chi? He's obviously Wen Wu's best asset. I mean, he even has explosives and throwing knives, but whatever. And Sha Ling just lets him take her pendant because she's stupid. And then Shang-Chi runs after the Death Dealer to try to catch him to not let him get away with the pendant. They fight... Poorly choreographed fight, but whatever. And then just as he's about to kill the Death Dealer, he waits for some reason because he has a flashback where the Death Dealer is uh, making Shang-Chi suffer as he trains him, which is super weird to have a personal vendetta against the Death Dealer because obviously Shang-Chi would know that the Death Dealer is only following orders from Wenwu, the same as he was when he was a kid. So why does he have this personal vendetta against the death dealer as opposed to having it against his father. Like Shang-Chi even says in the plane, I would have done anything my father wanted. So obviously he knows that the same thing applies to the death dealer. Not to mention that him waiting to kill is dumb when he wants to kill the death dealer so much. And Shang-Chi just doesn't even try to interrogate the death dealer. Like he waits for a while to have his flashback, but he doesn't actually try to interrogate the death dealer. In that time he stops between trying to kill him and having the upper hand at that moment. It's dumb, I don't understand it. And then Wenwu shows up and he says, I told my men they wouldn't be able to kill you if they tried. Glad I was right. Which begs the question, if you didn't want them dead, don't send your men to kill them. If you had just gone to where they live and talked to them, would have been a lot more productive and wouldn't have gotten plenty of your soldiers killed. You moron. For some reason, Wenwu takes Katie to his home? Why the fuck would you do that? You're giving away the location 
of your compound to this random stranger. Just leave her at Macau or drop her off at San Francisco. Why are you so fucking retarded, Wenwu? Not to mention, Wenwu's base isn't really hidden all that well. Like, it's on the side of a mountain, you'd be able to see it from satellites considering how advanced technology is in the MCU, especially considering Edith established it far from home. So again, Wenwu just could not exist as a character. And then we get the first good character moment in the film. Katie asks Shai Ling if Wenwu will kill her, and Shai Ling says, just nod, don't talk, he'll forget you're there, that's how I survived. Which, considering how we're shown that she's been neglected by her dad after her mom died, and how she had to do everything on her own after her brother left, this line actually works, while also working on the dad side because he can't use Sha Ling as a soldier, so she's pretty worthless to him. Also, like Sha Ling says right after, she reminded Wenwu of his wife, Ying Li, so it makes sense he wouldn't want to look at her. That's actually a good line. However, Sha Ling says right after, I couldn't train with the boys, but I watched everything they did and taught myself to do it better. Which, how in the fuck did you manage that? You were a child watching men fight, you couldn't actually learn by simply watching and training what you thought you saw. You need to have hands-on training. And Shaling says that she started an underground fighting ring when she was 16, which how in the fuck would she be able to do that, considering not only she's 16, but that was the first year after the snap. How would she have the means and resources to do something like that? That is insane. Not to mention, how the fuck did she manage to escape Wenwu and his compound? And then they have dinner with Wenwu when they ask him how he was able to find them. And he says that he always knows where his children are. Which, it's fine that he knew where they were. Like, they were really stupid with covering their tracks. Like, Shaling actually uses her name in Golden Daggers and Shang-Chi changed his name to Sean. So, this isn't really an issue on Wenwu's part. It's more just showing how dumb Shaling and Shang-Chi were. And then Wenwu mentions Iron Man 3. He mentions how the Ten Rings and Mandarin in that film were based off of him and the Ten Rings. Which, the fact that Trevor's Mandarin in Iron Man 3 was based off of Wenwu shows that the Ten Rings is well known enough that S.H.I.E.L.D., for example, should know of him and therefore should have shut down this stuff ages ago. Or at least after they had a force like Avengers that was strong enough to do it. And also regarding All Hail the King. I didn't get to watch because I've seen the... The Marvel one shot, I think it's called. Um, have you guys seen it? Like, I'll hail the king. I have it, they... but I know what happens in it. Ridiculous. Where they, yeah, where they basically retcon the, the whole Mandarin twist in Iron Man 3 because of the public outrage about that. And they're like, no, no, don't worry, guys. The real Mandarin is still out there. And basically, it's some guy who comes to interview uh, Trevor Slattery in prison. And um, I think he just asks him a whole bunch of questions. I saw this years ago. I forgot to watch it before watching the movie. Uh, he just basically interviews him. And he's like, uh, there's someone who would like to meet you. And Trevor's like, oh, do I know him? And he's like, nope, but you, stu you took his name. So even this movie isn't consistent with that because apparently the Mandarin name was just made up by by a uh, Aldrich Killian even though this this guy who this this interviewer guy who I'm assuming was sent by uh when we uh I mean he outright says you took his name so he's supposed to be mandarin but then this movie says he's not actually mandarin um so I was uh yeah bothered that they couldn't even Fucking keep up with the name. And then we get some backstory where Wenwu says that after he met Ying Li, everything changed. And so after he was beaten that time, shown in the beginning of the film, he decided to start dating Ying Li. I'm not exactly sure why. I mean, he spent 2,000 years wanting to rule and conquer the world and everything he could possibly want. And he decides to give all that up to this woman who beat him in a fight once. Now, the only reason I can think of why he would do that is to trick her into letting him in Chitalo, since she's the guardian of the interest Chitalo. But if that's the case, then why would Ying Li fall for that? I mean, even if that wasn't the case, why would Ying Li fall for that? Clearly, that's the most reasonable thing she would think of. Like, why would she assume that he would just give that up for her? Because, what, they had a picnic? Is that it? Not to mention, she also teaches him how to fight like her, as we see in this flashback, this montage of them bonding together. And it's so weird as well that he thinks he could just come back and be fine, even though she says to him the first time they meet that she would kill him if he didn't leave, and he just decides to come back without an army or anything. I guess to take her out on a date, which I already said is 
you know, completely out of character. It's an assassination of his character. Why would he just decide to date Ying Li as opposed to, you know, continuing conquering the world? And it's even worse that Ying Li just leaves her home to be with them because she's supposed to be the guard to the entrance of Talo. Like, how does she not think he's trying to find a way to enter Talo, considering she knows about what he did? He shared his past with her. Like, he just got the one person who was guarding the entrance to Talo out of there. Maybe you'd think that he's trying to manipulate her into getting in, but she just does not think that and just leaves with them. And good for her. Um, he actually did change. And now I guess he just doesn't want to conquer stuff anymore after 2,000 years of conquering everything he could. At least according to, you know, the narration of the film, but not in actuality, as I've already talked about in the beginning of the video. And so when Wu says that Ying Li isn't actually dead, he's been hearing her voice and she's actually trapped in Talo, which... Keep that in mind, I'm not done with it yet. But then he takes the pendants, puts them in this statue, and it shows Wenwu a passageway that he says tells him the exact route he needs to take inside the bamboo forest and the exact time, because apparently that passageway only opens once a year. So he needs to leave on a specific day at a specific time to go through that route and not actually have his army be, you know, completely destroyed by the bamboo forest. Which kind of makes the bamboo forest seem more formidable than it actually is, because um, he could just fly over it. Like, just take a helicopter, fly over it, and then you arrive at the entrance to Talo, and th that's it. That's all you need to do. He did not need to get the pendant. He could have just flown over. So him going after his children is made retroactively pointless, other than him wanting them to join him. But because they don't, he just locks them up right after the scene. So, yeah, that was a pretty pointless first act, wasn't it? Other than, you know, getting the hero involved in the story, even though he shouldn't be involved. So that's already broken beyond belief. But yeah, when Wu imprisons Shang-Chi, Sha Ling, and Katie in his compound and says to his men that they'll leave in three days, implying that in three days, that's when the passage to Talo will open, and so he'll be able to get there. Which, keep that in mind, that will be quite important. But then, as Sha Ling, Shang-Chi, and Katie are in the prison, they just happen to hear a fucking voice of a man screaming, and as it turns out, it is Trevor. Trevor Slattery from Iron Man 3. Yeah, he's imprisoned here because when we were so offended by what Trevor did to him in the events of Iron Man 3. Now let's look at this from a strategic standpoint. If you actually kidnap Trevor, you're calling attention to yourself as opposed to just letting Trevor exist and draw attention of the US government bodies to the fact that Trevor is actually the leader of the Ten Rings, or that the Ten Rings is just made up, which means that Wenwu would be able to continue existing in the shadows as they say he wants to, or at least they'd pin everything on Aldrich Killian, as opposed to actually going after Wenwu because he kidnapped Trevor Slattery to imprison him in his own prison. Well, he actually kidnapped him to execute him, and Trevor started doing a monologue from a play or some shit, and they were like, yo, let's use him as a court jester. Yeah, this film is kind of strange. Anyway, kidnapping Trevor Slattery and keeping him in your prison is really dumb from that strategic standpoint. Not to mention, he wasn't really defaming Wenwu's name. When you consider that Wenwu said earlier in the film that he's not called the Mandarin, that was a name that Aldrich Killian made up. Which, if that's the case, then why is Wenwu so upset? They're not actually using any of his own names. So this isn't really offensive to Wenwu. Almost seems like they wanted to include Trevor in the story, but couldn't find a proper way to do it, and that's how it turned out. Not to mention that if... When we actually did care so much about Trevor and the transmissions in Iron Man 3, why did he not kidnap Trevor during Iron Man 3 as opposed to, you know, after all was said and done? And if he did actually want it to stop, you'd think he'd go after Aldrich Killian and not Trevor Slattery, because Aldrich Killian is the one who was in charge of all of it, and Trevor was only an actor playing out a role. So either he'd go after Aldrich Killian alone, or Aldrich Killian mostly, and Trevor Slattery, maybe. But either way, he wouldn't go after them because it's beneficial for him, for them to exist. And so, as Shang-Chi and Katie are talking to Trevor, Xia Ling manages to somehow break a brick wall? Uh, she should not be that strong film, but whatever. And she just happens to know the path through the tunnels to get to the garage to steal a car. Because she was imprisoned here when she was young, and she happened to escape. Which, how the fuck did she manage to single-handedly escape from her dad when she was 16? 
I do not understand how this film functions. And then for some reason, Wenwu doesn't have cameras in the prison cells because if he did, the plot wouldn't be able to happen. He would just stop Shang-Chi and the other characters from leaving the prison. Oh, and the reason why they have to leave right now is because as they meet Trevor, they also meet Trevor's pet called Morris. And Morris is a being from Talo that Wenwu brought in one of his many visits to Ying Li and just kept him. And Trevor learned how to speak Morris's language somehow. And Morris knows how to get them to Talo the next morning, regardless of the path opening or not. Now, if that's not the most convenient fucking plot device you've ever seen in your life, I don't know what to tell you. Like, why would Wenwu even bring an animal from Talo? How would that animal have left Talo? They're supposed to all remain in Talo. And we know that Wenwu was banished from entering Talo, as we'll later learn in this film. So if that's the case, then he couldn't have brought an animal from Talo. It had to be outside of Talo, which it shouldn't be because it doesn't make sense for it to be outside of Talo. So yeah, Morris is my least favorite plot device in any media ever. So well done, film. And then they steal a car, a Blade Arm Man's car, which we now learn his name is Razor Fist. And they don't realize that Shang-Chi and the other characters are leaving with the stolen car until they're already inside because, you know, the, the plot needs to happen. And for some reason, Wenwu doesn't use the Ten Rings to stop the car leaving. He just sends his men after them, even though these are the only people in the entire world who are trying to stop Wenwu and the only people who could possibly warn the people of Talo of Wenwu coming to attack Talo. So fucking well done, Wenwu. You're a fucking moron once again. And then it's hilarious, after the car escapes, Wenwu just doesn't follow it, even though the car is going to Talo. Why? If the car is going to Talo, just follow it, and then you're not gonna have to, you know, go through the passageway. You can just follow them and be like, yes, now we're in Talo, and you can stop them in the meantime. Like, even just send one man after them, so he can scout the area, as opposed to just letting them go. It's not like they're very covert. The car they stole is very unique. And they're stopped just in front of the bamboo forest for a long, very, very long time. And so we see them in the next morning, standing outside the bamboo forest, waiting for a signal from Morris. But then Morris gives them a signal and Katie starts driving through the forest. And she drives really slowly at first, which I think is strange considering how Katie is established to drive really fast and recklessly since her first scene in the film. Not to mention that Morris should have warned them beforehand that they need to go fast because Morris knows that the forest closes very fast. So if they don't go fast, they're fucked. And also considering how fast the forest opens and closes, there's no way humans could get there if they were on foot. However, we do know that humans can get there on foot and just avoid the entire forest opening and closing shit because of when we're going to visit Ying Li, which just means the system of protecting Talo is really bad because you can just, you know, arrive there on foot and it doesn't really ultimately matter that the bamboo forest exists, which was already pointless because you could just fly over it, but, you know, walking on foot through it is even worse than being able to fly over it. And it's interesting that the forest actually closes around the characters just before they arrive at the entrance, but they are able to drive through it the last few layers of bamboo, which just means that bamboo is just normal bamboo and it's easy to drive through, which just kind of makes it pointless to have this bamboo forest because you could just destroy it very easily. Like, just drive a bulldozer through it and that's it. Hell, when we just use your 10 rings, we know how powerful they are. They can destroy this bamboo very easily, which again means he doesn't need to wait the three days. And so we see them arrive at Talo and they, you know, talk to the villagers, the inhabitants of Talo. And Shang-Chi, when he gets out of the car, he doesn't really say what he should. As he arrives, he should say exactly why he's there and explain the danger that may fall upon the village. He should be like, hey, I'm Shang-Chi, son of Ying Li. My father, Wenwu, is coming to destroy your village. We came to warn you and help you. Instead, he wastes time by either not saying anything or introducing Katie or saying, you don't understand. If his aunt hadn't shown up, he would have been attacked or something. Shang-Chi is really fucking dumb. And so the aunt explains to the characters what the voice that Wenwu was hearing is. She says that the voice promises people their greatest desires, and that's why people are alert to Talo to open the gate. And what's behind the gate is what's called the Dweller in Darkness, which is a dragon that supposedly will kill the world if he's freed. And Talo was created as a village. Its only purpose was to protect the gate, because if the Dweller in Darkness were to be released, the entire world is doomed. Which creates the huge issue that assassinates Ying Li's character of why the fuck wouldn't she have told Wenwu about this? If she had, the plot wouldn't have happened. 
Considering the power Wenwu has, you'd think she'd even be more careful about that. She wouldn't want him to be used when he has a thing that's strong enough to open the gate. And it's all like King Lee's protective of her past. Her narration says that she talked to Wenwu about her past in Talo. She told her kids about her past in Talo, but she never mentioned the fucking purpose why her village was built in the first place, which was to protect the world from this dragon being released. So if she had warned Wenwu that the Dweller in Darkness would try to trick him into freeing it, then none of the plot could have happened. Literally, the film could not exist. The plot of the film hinges on a character assassination. Well done, film. And then Katie is taken by some of the villagers to learn archery and uh she trains for a day and she gets insanely good at it which we'll get back to don't worry but yeah this is an issue she would never be this good at archery just you know off the bat after one day of training no fucking way which by the way is confirmed to be one day because katie herself says she learned archery the day before in the last scene of the film and then we have a scene where shang chi's aunt and him are talking and he asks her to try to teach him how Ying Li was able to beat Wenwu when they fought, because she was the only one who ever beat him. And then they fight and Shang-Chi learns how to use the airbending powers, like, insanely fast. I don't know how or why, that seems kind of overpowered, he just sticks to it. You know, normal trait of the Garys too. And then the ant tells Shang-Chi to stop hiding because it only prolongs the pain as if he's trying to repress the side of him that comes from his dad, you know, the bad side of him. But that's never hinted at or shown to be an internal struggle of Shang-Chi's. Which, to be honest, Shang-Chi doesn't even seem to have an internal struggle. We're 40 minutes away from the ending of the film, and we're trying to introduce it now. Which showcases the terrible pacing, but also the terrible character development, because really, I don't understand any traits of Shang-Chi's. He's not really a character up to this point. There's not really anything that's been shown of Shang-Chi that could indicate some sort of character. And the stuff that has are contradicted. And so, now we're going to talk about the timeline of events here. So, when Wenwu does the pendants thing, he says they'll go in three days. Which means three days from then is when the passageway will open and Wenwu will be able to take his army into Talo. To fight his way through the villagers to get to the gate that supposedly his wife is hidden behind. And then we see Shang-Chi, Katie, and Shaoling escaping at night, presumably the same night since it wouldn't make sense if it wasn't. Then they arrive at Talo and it's daytime, which means, you know, next morning. Then we see Wenwu saying the passage opens at dawn, but there should still be a day between these events. You could argue that a day passed off screen, but we see Katie saying after she shot the dragon, I only learned how to fire an arrow like yesterday, as I outlined earlier. So the timeline doesn't make sense. It's actually quite a big issue because the passage is supposed to open at a specific time, and yet Wenwu goes one day before he should, and he's able to get there. He should not be able to go through the bamboo forest. Unless he just, you know, skipped the entire bamboo forest, which makes sense because, like I said, it's useless, but then it's a big world building issue. Either way, it is a big issue, so there's not really anything I can do to defend this. And then we have a flashback that shows Ying Li dying, where we see the Iron Gang, this random ass gang, showing up and somehow killing Ying Li. I have no clue how they managed to sneak past all security that Wenwu presumably has, nor do I have any idea where Wenwu is. I mean, when he gets back, as we'll later see, he was carrying groceries. So I guess he just had very fortunate timing to catch Ying Li when Wenwu wasn't home because he was fucking buying groceries. Sure, film. Because, you know, if he was there, he'd grab the rings and the Iron Gang is fucked, so, you know. Not to mention how just this random ass gang showing up and taking revenge on Wenwu doesn't really make sense timeline-wise. Because Wenwu stopped trying to conquer everything and ruling over people in 1996. And this gang was supposedly having dealings with him up until that point. But this is 10 years after. If it's 10 years after, then why did they just now decide to attack King Lee. Could have made a lot more sense if it was something like Hydra, where Wenwu stopped dealing with Hydra and giving them weapons and working with them. And that's why they decided to attack King Lee. Which you would still need to fix the timeline, but it would have been better with how they were able to sneak past security, or you know, kill the security. Or even stake out to see when Wenwu would leave, so they could actually attack Ying Li when they wanted to. And then we cut back to the present and Shang-Chi is still talking to Katie. And it's super weird because he says he hates his dad and that he's going to kill him. That he's going to do what his father taught him. As if that's like this horrible thing that he's completely against. Even though he's killed a ton of Wenwu's goons throughout the film without showing a glimpse of remorse. And it's also terrible because for some reason, like I said before, Shang-Chi never turned his father into the 
authorities. So Shang-Chi says that his mom would hate the person he's become, but I think it's because he never turned his father into the authorities, but not even then, because Ying Li was actually super fine with Wen Wu and his past. She never really took issue with it. You know, 2,000 years of conquering and killing and destroying. Shang-Chi hasn't really done anything that's terrible that his mother would not forgive him for, especially when his mom forgave Wenwu. So they're trying to develop this arc that Shang-Chi goes through, but it doesn't really make sense, nor was it established earlier. And now we have 30 minutes left of film, and it's, you know, not enough time to develop this arc properly. And so, like I said, Shang-Chi is angry at his dad for his mom's death, and, you know, that he's gonna burn down Talo. But him wanting to kill his dad is a bit much when that hasn't been properly fleshed out throughout the film. That's the biggest problem with the characters, they have no moments to stop and the audience can get to know them. This is the first time this happened in the film and we're 30 minutes away from the ending. You could argue that the plane scene was also a character scene, but backstory is not character. How a character reacts to their own experiences is character. And so when Wu's army arrives at Talo the next morning, so like I said, two days, not three days after. Well done, film. And now when Wu's army has crossbows, you know, maybe that would have been useful at any point earlier in the film, as opposed to, you know, just using tasers or melee. Maybe? I don't know. Who knows? And also, where's that throwing knife that the Death Dealer had? All those throwing explosives. Those would be useful, wouldn't they? And then it's super weird that Wenwu, just before they start fighting and he talks to the ant and he's like, no, fuck you, I know my wife is behind that gate. I do not understand why he just tells his army to fight Talo's army and walks away, turning his back to the village. Because we know his rings would be able to win this fight easily. So why would you just tell your troops to fight instead of you fighting them on your own? That would be much more time effective. And then when they're fighting, Wenwu just walks in the middle of him, just walks, and nobody goes after him. No no one at all. And then, for some reason, Wenwu doesn't go straight for the gate. He goes to Yingli's shrine, but how did he even know that existed? Like, there's no possible way he would have known that a shrine for Ying Li exists. And also, I think, you know, maybe if you look at a shrine for your dead wife at her home, you're gonna think, hmm, maybe I've been lied to, maybe she is dead. Which is gonna get worse, as I'll talk about it later, but Jesus, I really don't understand Wenwu in this film. And so we have Shang-Chi and Wenwu talking before they start fighting. Their dialogue is terrible, but let's just skip over that, because I can't be bothered with this film anymore. Uh, and then they fight, and Shang-Chi survives a lot of shit that he shouldn't, because, you know, he's fucking human. But wh whatever, who cares anymore? So yeah, there's some terrible choreography with Wenwu fighting Shang-Chi. Not to mention how Shang-Chi should not be able to even hit Wenwu once, considering he's the one who taught Shang-Chi his skills. And because... Wenwu has the fucking ten rings to protect himself. And then we have a line where Shang-Chi says, You trained your son to be a killer. Is this what you wanted? Which would work if we had seen something establishing Shang-Chi being a killer or something earlier in the film. Especially him regretting it. Then we have a dialogue about Shang-Chi talking about Ying Li. Where he says, Even if you could bring her back, what makes you think she would want anything to do with you? But like... The fact he's done this terrible shit for 2,000 years and she was fine with it, I don't know, I think that kind of informs why she would still be fine with Wenwu. Like, what would she take an issue with that she was not able to forgive before? Like, what he did for those 2,000 years was simply for selfish purposes. Now he at least wants the love of his life back. He wants to rescue someone who he believes has been wrongfully kidnapped by her own people, and is keeping her from her own family. Is that really all that terrible? I think Ying Li would be fine with Wenwu doing that. And then Shang-Chi gets hit with fucking extremely powerful punch, where he's thrown in the water and he somehow survives it because the film wants him to, but whatever. And then the dad just goes to the gate without question, after hearing that he may be releasing an evil monster. So you know, you'd think that would make him think twice about doing it, but whatever. It's not like he just had to fight his own son to get to that gate. And then it's hilarious that there's nobody guarding the gate itself. Like, they had a day's notice, and yet they didn't plan to leave the fences at the gate itself. Okay, um... The Talo people are fucking moronic. And then Wenwu starts hitting the gate and these little monsters keep getting out as Wenwu hits the gate. And you'd think he'd think, hmm... Maybe these people weren't lying to me. Maybe I should stop trying to do this. I mean, I did see my wife's dead body. Which, yeah, the flashback we see of Wenwu looking at his wife's dead body, he sees her dead in front of his son. His son also saw her die. Like, there's all of that, and he had to bury her. 
You'd think if he actually does think that his wife has been kidnapped and imprisoned by Talo, he'd dig up her grave and be like, huh, there is a body here. He could even fucking take her bones to check the DNA to check if she actually is Ying Li, which he would be able to do and it would prove that it's Ying Li. It'd be quite easy for him to prove that Ying Li is actually dead all of this time that he was preparing to come to Talo. Like, I don't really understand how he believed all this time that his wife wasn't dead. It's like he never stopped after that first stage of grief, that is denial, but he had to because he prepared and sent Shang-Chi to kill his wife's assassin, which means he knows she's dead. Otherwise, he just killed this random man for no reason. Like, what the fuck is this film? I don't understand it. When why are you so moronic? And then for some reason, Shang-Chi can breathe on the water. I know that the people who are in Talo or who come from Talo, their power comes from the heart of the dragon or whatever. But still, the film never establishes that it was a power that the people of Talo had to breathe underwater. If it was the case, you'd think they'd swim towards Wenmu, and if it was just because he was dropped close to where the dragon is, that's really lucky that Shang-Chi is falling exactly where the dragon was. And it's also lucky that the dragon hadn't woken up before, or that it didn't wake up after Shang-Chi had already drowned. <laughs> and now, the monsters that Wenwu was releasing, they're soul-sucking monsters who capture souls to bring back to the gate, and those souls are used to feed the Dweller in Darkness that when he's strong enough, he's gonna break out of the gate. In these monsters, they seem to only die from things made of dragon scales, which then means that there's no way the Talo people will die considering they have dragon scale armor. However, we see these monsters being able to suck the soul out of the old guy who taught Katie how to fire an arrow, and he was wearing dragon scale armor. So it's not the armor itself. And we also see that huge dog killing one with its teeth. And so I'm confused. Is it just stuff that exists in Talo? Would touching the soul-sucking monsters with grass just kill them? But that can't be right because the dragon scale armor didn't work. So really, there are no stakes in this fight because anything just goes, really. When the soul-sucking monsters attack, you can just decide as a rider to kill off a character or not. And it only won't matter because there are no rules to follow for why this character would die. And then Shang-Chi goes after his dad right in front of the gate, right after he's woken up by the dragon, you know, the great protector as the dragon's called. And he just knows how to use the wind powers now, like as well as his mom did. He didn't need training or anything. That's really great film. And then Shang-Chi uses the dense fight move that his mom used on Renmu you know, all those years ago, and Wenwu just doesn't use his left arm to attack once again. So, you know, at least Wenwu is consistently retarded when he's doing this fight, either against Ying Li or Shang-Chi. Well done. And then we finally have, like, a good joke in the film, like an actually funny moment, where we see Morris walking through a bunch of dead bodies on the ground, and it reaches Trevor, and we're like, oh no, is Trevor dead? And then Morris pokes Trevor, and Trevor says that he's just pretending to be dead, and asks Morris to do the same. And I actually like that joke, because it's in character for Trevor to pretend to be dead, as opposed to actually fight, because why would he fight? As we've seen in Iron Man 3, he's quite the cowardly character, and that's been shown in this film as well. So that is actually like a functional joke. And then Morris falls on his back and pretends to be dead. And that's like, the one moment from the film where I'm like, ah, I am having fun. And then shang is just able to control the rings after they're fired at him somehow, without ever having to learn how to do it, which kind of takes away a lot from Wenru. Like, I get that he just happened to bump into the rings when he was young, like 2,000 years ago, but you'd think he would actually need to be quite smart, you know, very strategic, to be able to use the rings to its full potential. But I guess you can just learn that and just do it instantly, which takes a lot away from Wenru in terms of just stakes and his level of threat as a villain. And then... As Shang-Chi has the ten rings, as opposed to attacking his dad, he just throws the rings on the ground to stop fighting him when moved. Like, that's stupid. There's no reason at all for him to do that. Like, he doesn't go through an arc or through any meaningful change that explains why he'd do it. As far as we know, he still hates his dad and wants to kill him. Even though that did come out of nowhere, that was the last established thing we knew about Shang-Chi's character. But that's just gone. Okay, film. And then after this, after releasing so many fucking soul-sucking monsters, after we know that he saw his wife's dead body, after he just fought his son twice, almost killed his own son, and his son still is trying to stop him, Wenru still thinks Yingli is behind that gate. 
Okay, film. I also find it really weird how none of these soul eating monsters attack Chang Chi, considering he was the biggest obstacle keeping Wen Wu from breaking down the gate. And he was, you know, the closest to the gate other than Wen Wu. But, you know, plot needs to happen. And then, as the Dweller in Darkness leaves the gate, it grabs Wen Wu. And Wen Wu uses the rings to, uh, do, do nothing. <laughs> like the dragon kills Wen Wu. And that's pretty much it. Even though Wen Wu could have easily gotten out of there with the rings. But yeah, he just drops the rings and uh, gives them to Chang Shi. Which Chang Shi uses from now on. And that's how he's going to eventually defeat the Dweller in Darkness. And then, you know, this big ass dragon that's supposed to destroy the world if it's ever freed. That comes from another dimension. That's exactly the kind of thing you'd expect sorcerers to be aware of and to kill. Or at least protect against letting it out ages ago. You know, the Ancient One really wasn't good at her job, according to this film. It's not like it's not common knowledge. When Wu just found out about Talo by reading about it in books. Which also makes me question, hey, Wen Wu, if you were reading in books about Talo, did those books never mention, you know, the sole reason why Talo was created? Which was to protect the world from the Dweller in Darkness? So again, the plot just does not make sense to happen from a fundamental level. And then Shining shows up to help Shang-Chi and she's riding the dragon, the Great Protector. She just knows how to do that. Sure, why not? And then now, the old man for some reason only now, he tells Katie about shooting at the dragon's neck. How does the old man even know the neck is the weak spot? And why hasn't Shang-Chi or Shaolin hit the dragon's neck yet? Hell, how hasn't the great protector hit the dragon's neck? And then Shaolin is grabbed by one of the tentacles of the Dweller in Darkness and she just does not use her rope dagger to get out because she's stupid. And Shang-Chi also doesn't use the rings to free Shaolin because he's stupid. And it's supposed to be this meaningful moment where Shang-Chi is like, yo, I'm not leaving you this time. Which is like, yeah, Hell yeah, you're not. You left her with your abusive dad, who you knew would mistreat her and hurt her, and you never bothered to check if she was fine. The least you could do is not let her die right now. But then she doesn't die because Katie, with all her majesty, happens to hit a single arrow. And you know what's funny? Her last arrow. She hits it through the dragon's neck. And that's what hurts it enough for Shang-Chi to be able to kill it with the Ten Rings right after. And for it to just let go of Shaling. Katie who learned archery the previous day. Well done. And then after all said and done, we have a final scene where Shang-Chi and Katie are talking to their friends at the same bar we saw earlier. And then Wong just shows up at the bar to talk about the rings. Now, instead of right after the fight ended. Which is funny because Shang-Chi and Katie have actually said that this is at least a week after that fight happened. Yeah, Wong just waited a week to contact them. And he wants to take Shang-Chi because he wants to learn about the Ten Rings, but... If that's the case, why is he taking Katie too? She's worthless to him. And then we have a mid credit scene that confirms that the sorcerer should have gotten involved with the Ten Rings centuries ago because it confirms that the Ten Rings were actually from another dimension, so well done. Also, it's funny that Bruce leaves that meeting despite not fully studying the rings, he just leaves out of nowhere. It was a really strange scene. And also, it's funny, how is Bruce not Professor Hulk now? Like, I get that Endgame's arc with Hulk wasn't good because it skipped the entire development part that was needed but you know it's still the end of his arc with dealing with Hulk as another personality inside of him and just trying to coexist with it so if you just kind of backtrack on that and just have him not be Professor Hulk that's gonna be a lot worse because you're just completely undermining that character arc and just being like whatever he's Bruce now with no established reason as to why. And then we have a post credit scene where Shaling is a terrorist now, but women are allowed to be terrorists too. So it's fine, I, I guess. I don't know. Just fucking incredibly cringy song playing and, you know, Shaling now controls the Ten Rings, which is really stupid. Unless she decides to use it for good, which if that's the case, they should have shown her getting rid of the Ten Rings name and logos and shit and replace it with something else, which would visually symbolize that she's changing it for the better. As it's established now, it pretty much seems like she's just gonna run the Ten Rings as is, just, you know, women are allowed to be a part of it. Which does not make me like the Ten Rings any more than it did before, you're still terrorists, I don't care if there are women terrorists now or not. I'm sorry film, this isn't the feminist moment you want it to be. But then, you know, the film uses the, the Ten Rings will return, so, I don't know, maybe there'll be a villain in Shang-Chi too, the legend of the Twenty Rings, but uh, I'm not sure. So yeah, that was the film. Overall, the characters are fucking terrible, none of them function, and they don't get nearly enough scenes to flash them out. 
The plot is in tatters, nothing makes sense. They couldn't even get the timeline right for when Wenwu goes to Talo. And thematically, it's a mess. It's either trying to go for the theme of living up to your potential, which is dumb because Shang-Chi just gets new abilities in the third act without working for them. Same for Katie, who just learns archery in a day. Or it's trying to go for accepting your past, which the film does have Shang-Chi accepting his past, though he changes his mind about it for no reason, since he was ready to kill his dad and then just doesn't. And, you know, visually it's horrendous, it has terrible color grading and terrible green screen and CGI. And the acting wasn't good either. The best was Tony Leung, you know, Wenwu's actor, but he doesn't really get that much material, considering how contradictory his character is. I like the soundtrack, I think the soundtrack is actually, like, pretty good. So yeah, overall it's a mess of a film. I think it's impressive that I thought it was only mediocre on a first watch. This is, it's really, really terrible. So yeah, fuck this film. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed, leave a like, subscribe if you're new to the channel. Check out my podcast in the description called Ecom. We actually covered this film before I made this video. So if you'd like to check that out, that'd be fun. And also a shout out for Madvocate for helping me out with some pretty big portions of this video. The video would not have been as accurate as it was if it weren't for Madvocate and I just going through the film quite a few times to understand all its issues. So yeah, thanks for watching. See y'all later. Goodbye.